we're in this series of messages on the parables this summer. And uh, I always like to say, and Chris did this, and he, you know. <laughs> but um, uh, today, if you have a Bible, turn to uh, Matthew 13. That's in the New Testament, that's the back part of the Bible. <laughs> um, does it, I don't take anything for granted with you people. <laughs> the big numbers are chapters and the little numbers are verses, okay? So that's... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, the same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood around on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path. The birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they didn't have much soil. They sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. <coughs> Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you teach them in parables? So, Lord, teach us on this parable. How can we live? How can we uh, serve? How can we grow? in you and the way you would have us. That's our need today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Um, anybody ever heard this parable before? <laughs> okay, all right. So we're on new ground. <laughs> uh, this parable has been misused for years. Been misinterpreted. It's been mispreached. I probably mispreached it early on, and uh, it became particularly poignant to me um, for a number of years. I was teaching um, strategies for congregational renewal in uh, at Fuller Seminary for their doctoral program, and uh, it was during the time when there was this big movement, uh, a church growth movement in the church, and how. Strategy. We could find the right formula. We could really just blow churches all over the world and have them grow the right way, you know. And uh, I was I was always at odds with it, but because um, I believed in the church um, unrenewal, <laughs> um, but um, just newal, basically. <laughs> um, so, but what they would do is they would take this parable and say, "This is." This is beautiful. This is Jesus' marketing plan for us. <laughs> this is Jesus' marketing strategy, really. Kind of a pre-evangelism thing. And all you have to do is do an analysis of your community or some other person's community and determine who are the different soils and find out who's going to be receptive in a maximum way and then share with them don't waste your time on the rocky soil. Don't waste your time on the well-worn path. Don't waste your time you know, with the thorny group because they'll wear you down. But go find the really good soil, plant the seeds of the gospel there, and boom, you got a big church. <laughs> and, you know, I thought that makes sense, doesn't it? In a marketing kind of way. <laughs> yeah. You know, before seminary, I was a business management major, and I, you know, marketing has a lot of power. And I thought, maybe I'm all wrong here. Maybe it really is Jesus telling us the secret for how to spread the gospel by determining who is receptive and who isn't. Then I thought, no. <laughs> no. Actually, this is so not about them. This has nothing to do with those people. This has to do with us. And our receptivity to what God wants to do in us and what God wants to do through us, right? 
and all around us and, and are we receptive to that and can we allow the seeds of the gospel to take root deep into our lives and bring forth great fruitfulness now looking out at y'all just saying I'm sure you're all the fertile soil <laughs> you're, you're all the fruitful receptive pathways right uh, they're not a, there's, they're not a rocky road among you. <laughs> there's not a thorny person here. <laughs> yeah. Well, the funny thing is, uh, the reason I picked this this uh, parable is that it's it's one of the few times in all the gospels where Jesus tells his pithy little sermon illustration, and then his followers gather around him and say, "Why do you talk like that?" <laughs> And they begin this discussion, and then he starts to tell them why. And he goes, and, and so at home, in your uh, devotions this week, I'd love for you to read the whole 13, mm -hmm. but he even goes on and explains it to them in detail, exactly, so that nobody can misunderstand what this is about. And then we get it all wrong, anyway. Well, um, what kind of soil are we? In the 50s, there was a, a little church history. There, <clears throat> there was a phrase that was developed. It came out of uh, Pennsylvania, where uh, they, there was the uh, main line, was the highway. <coughs> and so the churches on the main line, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Congregational, you know, they were the main line churches. And then that phrase took off. And we started to see ourselves as the main line. We were the well-worn path churches. Isn't that interesting? We were the churches that uh, seeds fell on the path and it was, you know, it was, the ground was hard because it had been used a lot and it was a thoroughfare and nothing's going to sink in here. And it's, it, it was that way for the, these main line denominations for the next 50 years. God couldn't penetrate them. I'm just saying that, you know. And in our lives, it's very easy to get caught up in the in the mainstream, in the main line. It's it, whatever the culture is, whatever the flow is happening. We get in that, and and it's easy to go because there's momentum. And you know what? When when you're uh, moving along, you don't have to think much, right? Okay, so just to test here, anybody ever drive on that freeway, that Highway 5? You know, you ever commute on that when there are a lot of cars there? Okay, you, you do not think. You, you just kind of go. It's instinct, right? Uh, and sometimes, okay, I have a confession to make. Sometimes I get going on that, like coming down here this morning. And I forget to turn off at 145th because I always went down to Northgate and turned right. to our church. <laughs> and I'm thinking, did they move the church or what? <laughs> well, yes, we did. <laughs> but, but you know, you, you don't think, and then all of a sudden, or if you're used to going a certain place all the time and then you're heading somewhere else, and you go, why did I go here? <laughs> well, it's because you're brain dead and you're driving on the main line. That's what you do. You just go with the flow. And I'll tell you what, there are a lot of people in my life, and, and a lot of times I do it, it's just easier to go with the flow. And there is no way that God's word can penetrate our lives when we're caught up with the flow. We just, the, the word sits on the surface and it gets picked away. I hope it's not by the crows because they're smart. <laughs> they remember, you know. They're mad at me. <laughs> Don't hurt a crow, they'll, they'll gang up on you. But, uh, you know, that, so they get picked away. And the seed never takes root, never grows. But then it talks about the rocky soil. Uh, which is usually not well-traveled, right? So we're going our own way and... There's obstacles. The ground's hard. It's not a place where the roots can go deep. 
but they do go in a little. And, and so what's Jesus saying? So the, the plant grows up, it, it springs up, and you go, whoa, this is great. And then the heat of the day, and the dry, dryness of life, and pretty soon, wilt away. And it's funny because, uh, you know, I, 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 I can be all of these soils, you know, you, you know. Um, when I get rocky, when I get in a rocky place, I can pretend everything's great for a very short period of time, you know. But then the reality of what's happening sets in and I wither away. And I, and I know from talking with you, some of you have the same experience where you just go, um, I thought I was doing so well, and then <laughs> I'm not. With the rocky soil, the hard soil. Thin veneer. Isn't that weird where you, you have your life and then you have this thin <coughs> veneer of how it looks on the surface? And that's an effective veneer, except that it's not very deep. Then you got the thorny. Seeds take root, they grow, and then <clears throat> other things are growing right alongside and sometimes more powerful. And, and they choke them out. They choke the life right out of it. Jesus goes on later in the chapter to say, you know, the, the, the troubles of life, the stresses of life are, are like the thorn bushes that choke you. They choke the life right out of you. I know what that feels like. Don't you? Or you, you, you go, I'm growing. I'm, I'm, everything's happening. It's work. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and you let something happen, and then it just stews in your brain, and then it kind of takes over, and then it grows, it grows, it grows, and then, you know, you don't have to be OCD to, to have your life choked out of you. It still can happen. And then he says there's the good soil. Seeds fall in the good soil, rich harvest, geometric growth, all these things happen. Now just trust me, this is not about, we can really grow our church if we can find the people who are the good soil and get rid of all the others. Because if we got rid of all the others, there'd be no one here to welcome <laughs> when the good soil shows up. We need some of you thorny folk. <laughs> But, you know, we're wrong about this because it really is about us. And, and uh, so this week, um, Monday, I had a radio interview in Chicago, the drive home time, and then Tuesday morning, I had one in Toronto. So, um, what did they want to know? They kept asking me, okay, so your books, you know, for, uh, when everything goes wrong in life, you know. I didn't sign up for this, you know. And uh, they like that, but then they go, what do you tell people where everything's going wrong in their life? What can you possibly say to them? Well, that's why I wanted to have my phone disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there's an emergency over here, I gotta take care of you. Uh, what do you say to them? What do you say to them? What do you say to the folks around you who, who uh, you know, right now, life, everything's going wrong? I'm with I'm, you. I'm, yeah, I'm here I'm for you. you. I'm here for you. I didn't think to say that. <laughs> <laughs> you should have called a friend. <laughs> Can I call a friend? <laughs> I'm not going to ask the audience. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm with you. Now, that would be a very powerful thing to say, wouldn't it? That's probably the right answer. What I said was is, tell them it's going to change. I know you're frowning, Dave. It's all right. It's not as good as yours. I, I just said, tell them it's not going to stay the way it is. Because when you're in a situation, you think it will always be this way. Nothing will ever change. I said, we can never have hope unless we believe that something can change. But I said, the other side of that is, you all know this, if you're doing really good and you're really great and you're better than everybody else, that's going to change. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's going to turn. 
That's why there'll always be sales on my book. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, I'm with you always. Right. So you guys got the right answer. Okay. West Paul said, it's going to change. <laughs> so who are you going to believe? <laughs> it's going to change because Jesus is with you. Yeah, okay, yeah. Try and make it work. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, I think that the message of this parable is not the world is segmented into four areas. Which one are you in? That is not the message of this parable. It's not saying, well, I guess I'm, in, I'm among the thorns, you know, they're growing up and they're choking the stew out of me. So uh, that's what I got. That's the way God made me. I can't help it. Or, well, I'm just caught up in the current. I'm just on the main line. I'm just, it's the way I am, you know, and I'm, I'm shallow and superficial and uh, God's word bounces right off me. That's just the way I am. Lord love me. You know, <laughs> you know that's not it. The, the issue is, what would it take for every one of us to be receptive to God's word, to be open uh, to receive what God wants to do in us and through us. And what would it, what would it mean for us to be fruitful and uh, geometrically uh, fruitful? What would that take? Seems like it'd be pretty complicated, wouldn't it? I mean, that'd be pretty hard to do. So I start uh, thinking back. Uh, there's a lot of things I don't know about. You know that. Uh, one of the things I don't know about is I don't know anything about growing stuff. And uh, now Larry is a master gardener, you know, from the Utah, and he looks down on me. And, you know, I, you know, I, I, I get it. You know, it's a kind way. You know, you know West Falls. So, but I have tried over the years, and, and uh, when when Sheila and I lived down in, in California back in the back in the old days. Uh, Northern California, where we were, uh, Walnut Creek had clay soil. Mm -hmm. Clay soil, you don't notice it because everybody kind of rolls out their fake lawn, you know, <laughs> over the top of it, so it looks nice. Uh, but about a little ways underneath the surface is clay, mm -hmm. and which means when it uh, rains, for example, where does the water go? It goes down till it hits the clay, and then it sits there. And so you actually can be like on a really nice lawn and everything, and then it, 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 you start squishing because the water's just, it looks good on the surface, but, it, but it's just turned into a lake down below. So I tried growing stuff. Potatoes, tomatoes, <laughs> carrots. You can see little short carrots, you know, they don't go down into the ground. And so, I, now, uh, my dad, who had a degree in agricultural engineering from UC Davis, know it all. You know? <laughs> he kept saying, let me help you with this. And I went, no, I, I got it. You know, so I'd, I'd go to Home Depot and buy these bags of junk you know, to put in it and I'd stir it up and then I started mulching and I'd throw the garbage out. The neighbors loved that. Oh my gosh, and I'd do a pile of garbage going there next to the fence. And uh, nothing worked. And, and after several years of this, uh, my dad was up visiting and he said, you know there's something you can do. And I go, okay, I surrender. What is it? It's probably hard. I'd have to tear up all the ground 10 feet deep and <laughs> replace it, you know. Let's go buy a bag of lime over at the hardware store. Yeah, then what? <laughs> Make limeade? You know? <laughs> and, uh, Put in a baseball diamond, you know, I don't know whatever they do with it. And uh, so we put it in, and he said, you know, every farmer knows this, it dissolves the, uh, breaks up the clay. For two ninety nine, the problem was solved. Once I stopped being defensive and arrogant and not letting the real truth speak into my life, now the point of this is not to teach you how to garden. The point of this is sometimes 
it's that simple for our receptivity to change. Sometimes if we just stop blocking what God wants to do, if we, if we stop settling for what we've got, if we stop uh, defending ourselves, well, at least I'm not like the well-worn path. I'm, I'm a thorny, <laughs> suffocated, strangled person. I'm a lot better than them. You know, I at least grew up a little bit, you know. I'm not like the rocky thing. You know, we, instead of comparing ourselves with others to justify how we are, what if we went, Lord, change me. See, what did we sing today? Create in me a clean heart. There were times in my life where I would have gladly sung, create in you a clean heart, oh Lord. <laughs> Renew a right spirit in you. You know, I mean, I, I, I could have done that finger pointing stuff. But we sang, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in who? In me. In me. Maybe that's the prayer that works like, like lime in the clay soil. An openness to say, Lord, change me. Forget about everybody else who's waiting changing. Change me. And I believe when that happens, the transformation comes and we actually can become receptive. Will there still be thorny parts of our life? Will there still be uh, what Jesus called the worries of the world strangling us? That, thorns are going to grow up. Will there still be rocky places and the temptation to remain shallow in our faith, in our relationships, in our communication? I'm sure there'll be temptations to do that. Will there be currents sometimes where we're just brainlessly going along with the gang? Probably, what would be different? We say, Lord, change me, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit in me, that actually his word can take root and go deep. And we don't have to pretend, keep a veneer up, anything like that. We can actually uh, discover that the fruitfulness that God wants to give us is so far beyond us, it, uh, no one would ever confuse us with achieving that. You notice the low productivity that Jesus talks about is the 30 times growth? <laughs> 100 times 60, some 30, 30 times growth. You know, 30 times growth is good. What would God do if we would ask him to create in me a clean heart? What would God do? I think he would do everything. I think he would do everything to make us into the men and women that he, he had in mind when he first made you. When we first thought you up. You're my child that I love. In spite of thorns and rocks and well-worn paths, in spite of all that stuff. Now let me be productive through you. Now if you want to still just apply it to other people, that's a good way to stay safe and shallow. It just isn't God's way. So my encouragement is, Ask him in. Ask him in again and ask him to have his way in you. And I'll ask him to have his way in me. He might treat us each a little bit differently, do a little different work in each of us, but the result is going to be <coughs> magnificent. Let's pray. Lord, we do belong to you. And we come here today to worship you and to remind ourselves of who we are and who you are, who we are together. So Lord, we pray that you would work your saving grace 
deep down into our lives. Let your word go deep in us. And Lord, we ask for nothing less than transformation. Transform us by your spirit. We'll give you the glory. Amen. Amen.